Welcome to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, which are a production of uh, Politics in Motion. I want to continue talking a little bit about uh, indebtedness and uh, the role of indebtedness in the development of economic life. Chris Caruso, Director of Politics in Motion. I'm a popular educator, community organizer, and educational technologist. Politics in Motion is a new anti-capitalist media platform founded in May 2023 by David Harvey, Miguel Robles Duran, and myself. We're working to create an intellectual strike force from the left. Our collective aim is to unsettle and combat the ideas of the billionaire class. We are assembling leading thinkers on our podcast to redefine strategies to build socialism in a transdisciplinary, non-sectarian way. We're proud to offer our Patreon supporters exclusive monthly live question and answer sessions with our podcasters. Questions will be submitted in advance as well as live so that our supporters can dialogue directly with our team. Podcasts from Laura Rakovic and from Ecuador, Ana Rodriguez will be launching soon. And we're thrilled to announce that we have new podcasters joining our team. From Brazil, Raquel Rolnick. From the UK, Andy Merrifield. And from the US, Willie Baptist, Sierra Taylor, and John Wessel McCoy. Our aim is to have all our podcasts launched by the end of 2023. Please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash politics in motion. Thank you. Uh, last week, I pointed out that uh, the, the basic means by which consumerism is developed in such a way as to be consistent with the growth of uh, an economy based upon profit-seeking was to expand uh, indebtedness. But it turns out that the credit system and the circulation of interest-bearing capital and the development of indebtedness has another very, very strong role. And uh, therefore, there is, a, if you like, a, a double force which is concentrating upon uh, the credit system. And that double force is related to the fact that increasingly in the history of capital, uh, capital has required more and more fixed capital. Uh, fixed capital uh, within the factory in the form of uh, machines and plant and all the rest of it, so that you can readily understand the economics of that, but also a fixed capital of what Marx called fixed capital of an independent kind, that is fixed capital that would be used in common. Uh, we think of, uh, for example, uh, the sorts of infrastructures that are required, roads and ports and harbours and all those kinds of things, uh, which are going to be used by capital, but uh, are used very often on a common, common basis. So the fixed capital of an independent kind. And the, the fixed capital of an independent kind can be divided into two parts, which is one part which is immobile and embedded in the land, uh, and the other part is mobile and therefore uh, capable of being moved around at will. Uh, the best way to think about this is to think about investment in a transport network. You have the rails and the roads and the ports and the harbours uh, which are fixed in the land. Uh, then you've got the ships and the, the, the trucks and the, uh, the aircraft and all the rest of it that, can, could, that are mobile. So that if you kind of said, what's the fixed capital in common, you would say something like a transport system uh, is a very good example of, the, of that, and part of it is fixed in the land and part of it is, is moving. So an increasing amount of fixed capital of this kind is terribly important because that is one of the ways in which you increase the productivity of labor. The productivity of labor depends 
upon having fixed capital of an independent kind embedded in the land or in, in, in motion, uh, and that uh, therefore uh, that fixed capital is significant. Now, the other aspect is the same thing applies in the world of consumption. That, uh, in fact, a lot of uh, consumerism is, is fixed over time. And Marx calls this uh, the consumption fund. And the, and the biggest items in the consumption fund are housing, uh, for example, workers' housing, uh, and uh, automobiles, uh, and so on. And by talking about that, we also see that there's a possibility of not only collective use, uh, but joint uses. Uh, and Marx points out that uh, a road can be used for production uh, or it can be used for taking walks and that therefore there's a dual use problem here, an interesting problem. Uh, so that uh, all of this uh, is therefore uh, part and parcel of the development of capital. The capital depends more and more upon fixed capital employment and then the question arises, is, uh, you know, how, 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 is, how is it funded? How is, how, who, who funds it and, and, what, and what do we do uh, with a railway system that is built and then will last 50 years or 100 years? What do we do with uh, housing which uh, will be built uh, maybe for 50 years before it needs to be renewed? Uh, what do we do with, uh, with all of these items which are very long, have a very long life? Uh, and which somehow or other have to be financed. And the, the answer is, of course, that they are financed on credit. That uh, if I had to save up uh, all the money I needed to buy a house, it would take me a long, long time and I'd have a lot of money stuffed under the mattress, a vast amount of money stuffed under the mattress, and then uh, after I'd saved maybe, uh, you know, let's say $300,000, I would be able to go out and get, you know, count out my $300,000 and buy the house. Uh, well, obviously, that, that, that's not, not, not workable at all. So uh, one of the things that happened in the Great Depression was recognizing the significance of this as a form of, a, of, of consumption. Uh, they introduced the 30-year mortgage in the United States and said basically uh, you can make a down payment of maybe 10% on a $300,000 house and you can pay off the mortgage over 30 years. Uh, so the credit system becomes very, very important in terms of consumption. Same thing in terms of, of, of production. Uh, and then there's something here in production which is a terribly, you know, a, a very interesting feature, which is uh, what we call leveraging. Now, leveraging works like this, and it, it's, it's, it's actually quite complicated, but I'll try and make it as simple as possible. If I buy a house for $300,000, and if I then rent it out at 6% uh, or something, some, uh, rent, rent it out, uh, I can get a return of, say, 6% on my $300,000. Uh, okay. Now, what happens if instead of me putting $300,000 down, I actually put down, uh, let's say, fifty thousand, uh, let's say, hundred thousand dollars, and I borrow the the, the remainder, another two hundred thousand dollars, and I pay five percent on the two hundred thousand dollars. Now, notice I may I pay six. I'm going to get a return of six percent on the whole thing, but I I, I borrow money at five percent. Well, that means that actually, what I can do is I can leverage. Uh, the, 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 uh, the buying of the house in such a way that I get a huge rate of return on the amount that I have invested, uh, as opposed to the rate as if I get 6% rate of return on the total and I'm paying 5% on, 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 uh, on the, of interest, then actually I can end up uh, getting about 25% on the amount of money I have put in. And this accounts for something. It accounts for the fact that capitalists are very reluctant to invest their cash. They want to always borrow money. They always want to work on borrowed money because they can leverage in this way. With a 6% rate of return overall, they can get money for themselves at the rate of you know, 25%. So this leveraging becomes significant. So it was in interesting when 
Uh, Elon Musk purchased Twitter for $40 billion. He didn't pay cash for it, he borrowed the money. He borrowed the money because he could leverage it. And everybody works on leveraging, so that the capitalists love uh, the financial system because it allows them leveraging. And, you know, leveraging, uh, uh, leveraged buyouts are very, very common. That is, uh, somebody wants to buy a soccer club like Manchester United, uh, which, is, which is an actual case. Uh, in, in, in the, the, the family that bought it, the Glazers, they bought it at a leveraged buyout. That is, they bought the, the, the thing for, I don't know how many billion dollars, but they, they bought it, but they borrowed all of the money. And then the difference between what their actual rate of return is in Manchester United and what they have to pay in interest yields them a tremendous amount of money, and then they gradually pay off the debt. Now, the interesting thing here is, of course, the more, more equity you hold, the less valuable the thing comes. You, you, you maximize your, uh, your income uh, when you are maximally leveraged. Uh, as you get to the end of maybe uh, 10 or 15 years of, of it, they typically what uh, you would do is you'd renew it, you'd re-leverage it again, you'd re re refinance it. Uh, so so uh, what you start to see here is that the whole production of a, of a built environment, the whole production of um, uh, fixed capital and uh, consumption fund is crucially dependent upon uh, uh, upon the, the the credit system, and Marx actually makes this point in the Grundrisse. So he kind of says, "Well, uh, the logical r r response and the logical endpoint of uh, investments in the built environment, which you know, or, you know the, the logical endpoint of this uh, is is such." Uh, that uh, you may more and more leveraged and more and more uh, investment funds which are actually uh, lending you money uh, to buy things. So that pretty much every takeover that you see going on or every merger that you see going on is done with leveraged money. And you therefore, therefore, as Marx kind of says, uh, the development of the fi of fixed capital and the consumption fund, that development is contingent upon uh, the development of an adequate financial system and the operation of that credit system in such a way as to allow maximal leveraging. Now, Marx actually sort of half, half points this out in the Grundrisse. Now, notice here, we start uh, capital accumulation uh, on a cash basis. But over time, we more and more turn it into a ba something that is based on, on credit. And furthermore, maximal leverage is maximally profitable. So that as you become more, you get more and more equity in, in, in whatever you've bought, uh, so it is less and less useful to you. Uh, so that uh, you therefore refinance if you, if you have to, so that we end up with an economy which is more and more focused on, on, on the credit system. Now, what this has said, as I said in the, the, the last uh, uh, podcast, if finance, financialization is absolutely essential uh, to cover the, uh, the, the, the problem of the expansion of consumerism to match the expansion of production. production. So that credit becomes more and more important as time goes on. And now we have another thing which says credit is important in terms of fixed capital formation. In the initial stages of capital accumulation, fixed capital was relatively small and was relatively remote. And, and a lot of it was indeed cash financed. But as time went on, fixed capital became more and more elaborate. You needed more and more of it. You had, you know, be things became more expensive. Uh, you're expanding uh, the nature of the machines and you're having big plant and machinery and huge factories and things of this kind. So that uh, the more you, you, you do that, the more you rely upon on fixed capital and then you start to leverage and you start to use it even more so that we are living now in a highly leveraged economy with an extreme 
a dependency upon financialization. And again, I want to uh, emphasize that this is an important argument because many people write about financialization, but treat it as if, well, oh, isn't it interesting? It just happened. No, it did not just happen. It was actually built into the logic and the logical structure of a capitalist mode of production. And it was built in from the very outset. So that where we are now, right now was if we had actually read Marx right and developed the model right, we would have seen this would have happened, uh, you know, 150 years ago. Now we see it happening and we, can, we kind of say, well, it's inevitable. It seems to be inevitable. It's unstoppable. Yeah, well, yes, it is, but there's a very good reason why it's unstoppable and a very good reason why it may be the death of us and it may be the death of, of capital because at a certain point, uh, this uh, leveraging starts to create uh, a, a huge amount of indebtedness. And as I mentioned la again last week, indebtedness is a claim upon future labor. Now, the claim upon future labor, which now exists, is so huge that you really can't imagine that it could ever be paid off. I mean, if you want an analogy, of course, of this uh, claim on future labor, ask any student who has a huge amount of uh, student debt. Uh, in, a sense, in a sense, they accumulate student debt, and then there's a claim on their future labor for 10, 15, in some cases, 20, 30 years. And some people never get, get paid off. So the claim upon future labor is, is starts to become uh, untenable at a certain point, particularly if, if people can't afford to pay, pay the whole thing off. Uh, but what this, what this means is that leverage will also pile upon itself. That there is a sense in which we are looking at a situation where almost everything is Ponzi financed. That is, you accumulate debt and in order to pay off the debt, you borrow more to pay off the debt so that you're actually accumulating claims on future labor. And the claims are greater and greater and greater and huger and huger and huger. And therefore, there is a real, real problem uh, of how this, this debt is going to be valorized. And it's extremely interesting to me to listen to a lot of the discourse. Of the, for example, the Republicans in, in the Senate and in the House of Representatives go on and on and on about how all of this indebtedness is mortgaging the future of our children and so on. And of course, uh, they, are cor they are correct in a way. But, but uh, the thing is that what they're doing is they're looking at state indebtedness. And state indebtedness uh, was a very important thing, and of course Keynes used state debt as part of the way to recover from the slump of the 1930s to jack up demand and, and all the rest of it, and so Keynes was very strong on that, and we had on the, in the 1950s and 1960s a sort of Keynesian debt-led uh, economic development, uh, which was uh, relatively stable uh, actually, uh, until the 1970s when it became un unwound. But now, of course, uh, we're in this other world in which debt finance has become absolutely critical to the, the point where this accumulation of wealth is now seen as a, is now dependent upon an accumulation of debt. And that this is, uh, if you like, something which is, looks to be increasingly unpayable. Uh, the, the debt figures which came out from the IMF the other about two or three years ago took the total debted indebtedness in the world and then divided it by the glo global population so that every uh, person on planet Earth is in debt, was at that time indebted to the tune of something like $80,000 or $85,000. And now that's a huge, uh, but it is rapidly increasing exponentially. And if you look at the debt growth graph, graph uh, uh, graphs, what you see is an indebtedness which is growing, and that's an indebtedness which is attached, attached to profit making. In other words, the very fact of profit making means increasing indebtedness. Profit making is dependent upon increasing the productivity of labor, which depends upon more and more fixed capital which requires a certain amount of consumption, and therefore consumerism becomes important, and then we have to develop long-term structures of, of, of consumption, of housing, of, of automobiles, uh, look at uh, uh, the, the, the fixed capital 
uh, of, a, of a, a middle class kitchen, for example, the number of, number of gadgets that you have and, and, and so on is, is, is again immense. So that the consumerism has to expand and has to expand to keep pace with the, with the, the, the expansion of profit making. So this is the world we live in. And we have to understand that the only way in which we're going to be able to get off this train is to recognize what the train is about and where it comes from. And it comes from, of course, the necessity of the profit motive. If we take away the profit motive, how will the economy work? The only way in which the profit motive can be validated is by an, an, an infinite expansion of, of consumerism, which is an infinite expansion of indebtedness and all of that that, that, that means in terms of uh, future labor. And to the degree that future labor is dependent upon future labor, which is dependent upon future future labor, uh, we are ending up in, in what you might call a Ponzi economy, in which you're using uh, tomorrow's, you're, you're paying off today's debts by borrowing uh, on, on tomorrow's uh, market. So that the Ponzi scheme uh, if you like, the Ponzi finance scheme, which, which seems to be emerging out of this, is something that at some point or other uh, is going to be... Filmed. And if, they, if the Republicans are right and they actually do retire the debt, which, which I don't think they're very serious about, they never will do, but if they really did it, that would be the end of capital. That would be the end of capitalism. And it's, so it's interesting to see how, you know, these guys who come on the television and go on, and we cannot continue this debtedness, and da, 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 da. Well, OK, try stopping it and see what happens to you. Then you will see the explosion, and we will very, then have to discover some entirely alternative way of organising production and consumption so it meet, meets people's needs rather than meeting the needs of you know, the greedy financial barons and so on who are currently running, uh, uh, running politics and running, running everything else.